stay tuned because for the next 60 minutes, Motorsports Unlimited is on the air. Hi, I'm Jerry Bryant, and these are the lovely ladies of Motorsports. And all this hour, we're going to have 60 minutes of action-packed excitement. All kinds of exciting things will happen. And we got the famous Bill Wilt. And we got all kinds of other good stuff that's happening all this hour. Motorsports Unlimited. 60 minutes of non-stop action. So let's go to the studio right now, huh? Thanks, Jerry, and hi, everybody. Welcome to the studio headquarters of Chicagoland's most watched, most talked about access television series. Today, we're coming to you straight from the birthplace of American auto racing. I'm Tim Murtaugh, and this is the 458th edition of Motorsports Unlimited, and it's going to be a special one. Seven years ago, on our 91st episode, we explained that America's first auto race was held in Chicago on Thanksgiving Day, 1895. Last year, we took you for a ride over the entire course in a two-part episode designed to encourage the city of Chicago to stage an elaborate 100th anniversary celebration in 1995. Well, as the big day drew closer, it seemed to us that few remembered this important historic event that literally introduced automobiles to America a century earlier. It didn't appear that there was going to be a United States Formula One Grand Prix over the original circuit, as Bill had hoped. Matter of fact, it was starting to look like nothing was going to happen. Bill decided that regardless of what was going on, or not going on, we were going to do a show on Thanksgiving Day from the site of America's first auto race. The building you are looking at is the Museum of Science and Industry, but I would like you to use your imagination and pretend that this is 100 years ago. 100 years ago was 1895 because as we tape this, it's Thanksgiving Day 1995, and 100 years ago, the Museum of Science and Industry did not exist. Girls, come on in here. I want you to hear this story because this is particularly important, and I want to really, really thank these three girls. It is freezing cold today, and it is Thanksgiving Day, and that's what it was 100 years ago, and everybody had to make a lot of sacrifices in order to participate in the event that we're talking about today. The first thing I want to mention, though, is the building behind us. Museum of Science and Industry didn't exist until the mid-1920s, and yet in 1895, when America's first automobile race was held, it started right in front of this building. So here's a little test. Tammy, you're from Hawaii, so this is new for you. Tammy P, tell us what this building was. Um, I remember, so wait, let me think about it. Pegster? Was remember. that convention center or something, or uh, uh, some kind of a center? It. Go ahead, Tina. What was it? It was built for the World's Fair. World's That's Fair. exactly Fair. right. This is a leftover building from the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, which was called the Columbian Exposition. Now, the Columbian Exposition in 1893, yeah. yes, Columbian <laughs> Exposition in 1893 was a pretty important event for a number of reasons. Now, this was two years before the time that we're talking about, and what was important about it was that it marked the beginning of alternating current. If you'll remember a fellow named Nikolai Tesla, who was a famous 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 inventor and did most of the work involving alternating current which if you don't know is what everybody uses everywhere in the world for powering your houses and all that at the time Thomas Edison was a big proponent of direct current DC current Tesla was for alternating current. I won't go through the whole war of the thing, but what finally decided which way the world was going to go as far as lighting their homes and providing electricity for America and for the whole world, what really decided it was the Columbian Exposition in 1893 in Chicago or the Chicago World's Fair because Westinghouse, which Tesla worked for Westinghouse, got the contract to provide the electricity, which means they went with AC power, which was a brave decision back then because this was all new technology nobody knew it was going to work and the 1893 exposition was a huge success and the lighting was absolutely brilliant and it really proved the value of alternating current rather than direct current I won't go into all that because this is Motorsports Unlimited and that's not what our show is about <laughs> but I want to talk a little bit about the history of this building this building in 1893 was lit by alternating current because it was part of the World's Fair in 1893 Something else was going on in 1893, and what that was, was that uh, there was a newspaper in Chicago, and there was about a dozen newspapers at the time, but there was a newspaper called the Times-Herald. Times-Herald. And who was the publisher? I can't remember. Ah, Herman Colsett was the Colset. publisher. Colsett. I knew it was Colset. with a C. And in 1893, he took a trip to France. 
And in France, they had the first automobile race ever held in the world. And I believe it was Paris to Bordeaux, the first automobile race ever held in the world. And he was so impressed with how many cars, and by the way, the word cars didn't exist, the word automobile didn't exist. He was so impressed with how many horseless carriages there were that he was concerned that the United States was falling well behind. So he came back to this country and he w and attended the World's Fair also. And in the World's Fair, there were only a couple of little, oh, almost as an afterthought, devices representing the horses' carriages. And he thought America was getting way behind in this. So he wanted to use his newspaper, the Times Herald, in order to stimulate creativity in the automotive field. Or again, the automobile wasn't in invented. In fact, part of what he did was he had a... Um, uh, contest as part of uh, this first automobile race to try to name these vehicles. And the name that won, I'll give it away because it n didn't oh. stick. Say it? Motorcycles. Right. Motorcycles was the name that won the contest as what to call the horseless carriages. M-O-T-O-C-Y-C-L-E Motorcycle. It never, that never really stuck. But what he did was he said, we are going to have an automobile race and we're, it's going to be from Milwaukee to Chicago. That didn't work out because they couldn't get all the governments involved because it was two states involved and lots of counties and all that. They couldn't get that. So he finally settled on it was going to be from Chicago from right here to Waukegan and back. Uh, it was going to be, I believe, and I'm, some of this I might not be dead accurate, I believe it was supposed to be like November 2nd, 1895, and he had like 80 entries, but when the time actually came for the start of the race, there was only two people with running horseless carriages, so he wanted to postpone it for another, you know, 26 days, whatever it was, to Thanksgiving Day. And but, they, the, what, say it again? And they got mad and wanted to sue him. Right, exactly. The two guys that were ready said, no, wait a minute, you said the race was going to be, this is for five grand, you know, this is from real money. You said the race was going to be on November 2nd, so you got to do it on no November 2nd. Uh, uh, Cole that finally came to an agreement with these guys will run a demonstration race an exhib not a race but an exhibition from here to Waukegan and back on November 2nd and we'll run the real it'll give you extra money for that so they went for that so these two cars ran it was a Duryea and a Mueller Benz and they went to Waukegan and back and the Duryea got into an accident in Libertyville ran into a hay wagon and didn't finish and the Mueller Benz won the, <laughs> won the demonstration it took him Seven and a half hours? No, no, no. The, you're mixing it up with the, they didn't, we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have recorded times for that as how long it took, but you're getting it mixed up with the seven and a half mile an hour speed, uh, speed average for oh, the eventual race. Oh, that's right, that's right. He was going A little knowledge is a dangerous <laughs> thing. She read a little about this last <laughs> night. Okay. <laughs> But in any event, this was very exciting times. So what happens? So he he postpones it, and you guys are freezing, right? We're nah. I'm, I'm freezing. Well, you're from Hawaii. That's expected. <laughs> <laughs> poor, poor Hawaiian girl here. Well, we've uh, been here in Chicago all my life, so <laughs> I'm used to it. Okay. In any event, what was important? So they they, they postponed this race. They said, okay, uh, we're not going to. Um, uh, uh, have the race on the second. We had that exhibition thing, and we'll postpone it to Thanksgiving Day, which was 26 days later. Thanksgiving Day, and we'll have many more entries. Three days before Thanksgiving Day, 1895, they had a freak snowstorm with 60 mile an hour winds. The city was under snow. It looked like the city was impassable for this race, and so they there was pressure on him to postpone it again. But he was already kind of becoming the laughing stock. The other newspapers in town were making fun of him, saying these contraptions would never be anything. They'd never go anywhere. Blah 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 blah, blah and all the rest of it. So he says that race is going to come off no matter what. We're going to do it on Thanksgiving Day. So as we stand here right now, it is just about exactly the time, 100 years ago today, the first automobile race ever held in America was held right here in Chicago, starting literally right here from this point. And it was an important event. And he had to shorten it because of the snow conditions. He shortened it from here to Evanston and back, a 54-mile route starting right here going up Michigan Avenue and of course the outer drive wasn't there at the time but I think it was a road called Park West or something it went all the way up to Evanston and then a different route on the way back went by the old Riverview Amusement Park and then on out to Milwaukee Avenue through Garfield Park and Douglas Park and all the rest of it point was it really d did establish a bunch of things it established that the internal combustion engine the gasoline burning internal combustion engine was probably the way to go because those were the only two cars that finished interesting enough six cars made it to the starting line lots of cars were stuck in snow drifts in indiana and in the middle of illinois and on railroad cars trying to get to chicago for this race they couldn't get here because of the inclement weather conditions but six cars actually started a couple of them were electrics uh, they didn't go very far in the event uh, they went uh, oh i don't know a few miles and the heavy snow conditions used up their electricity very fast. A uh, couple of cars crashed out, and a couple of, uh, one crashed out, one broke out, and the two cars that finished the event were the same two that did the, the, the demonstration 
to Waukegan and back, except it finished in reverse order. The guy that crashed in Libertyville actually ended up winning this thing, and it was really only by a few minutes. But it's an interest. We'll talk a little bit more because we got to get the girls warmed up. But what I wanted to do, I said seven years ago, I did the first show about America's first automobile race, and what I was trying to do was I wanted to inspire some thinking out there. I think this celebration should have been a huge event in the city of Chicago. I wanted this to be the United States Grand Prix, a Formula One race over the original circuit of the first automobile race held in America because 95% of the streets are still here, so it was doable. And I hope for it to be a big celebration. We did the first show about this seven years ago. We did two shows about it last year, one year ago, hoping to stimulate some thinking. And I said to myself, well, if nothing else, 1995 Thanksgiving Day, if nothing else, I'm going to go down in front of the Museum of Science and Industry and just grouse about the fact that no big celebration occurred because this is really an important day. And a couple of weeks ago, I got something in the mail that somebody has actually put a little celebration together. So I said, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to talk about this first race. And if there's anybody around here to do anything, I'm going to show that to the audience too so we can say that our motorsports unlimited we participated in just a little bit of a piece we of history we, we were there okay <laughs> so does that make any sense at all that yeah, what i'm does. saying okay it, it does. does so this is actually a very important event and john i don't know if you've got it in your camera shot we've got june john kuchan on camera here today i want to make sure that we can see the building behind us we've got this again this, the architecture was just gorgeous on these structures and hopefully as i'm talking i'm also putting in a picture of the start of the first race which shows the building behind the cars the six cars that actually made it to the state and they're in the snow so <laughs> we're not we're not quite in the snow but it's plenty cold today oh yeah i was just gonna say that i can't believe how spoiled we are i mean these guys went on those um, the first race a hundred years ago and they had no covering over the car or anything and no protection at all as a matter of fact people were pulled from the vehicle suffering from exhaustion and exposure it was very very tough the day was not unlike today the temperature was about the same although there was of the 12 inches of snow that fell three days earlier there was still some six to eight inches and some of it drifting still around and the temperatures you can imagine you it, it was absolutely over. it really it was absolutely and brutal there were, there were no roads i mean it was dirt no 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 there were cobblestone streets for the horses in any event, folks, I hope we're going to find some people celebrating this occasion. I hope it's not going to be us, but it, even if it is just us, we're going to have a good time anyhow. Right, so we know how to. There you go. So if you guys would please tell the folks. Don't go away, folks. We'll be right back. While we were taping that piece, we noticed some activity across the street and wanted to see what was going on. But first, let's take a moment to meet the girls on today's show. Hi, I'm Peggy O'Donnell. I'm Tina Liu. And I'm Tammy Pete. Thank you, girls. Now, let's go across the street and see what's happening. Well, as I just told you, that if nothing else, I was going to stand down by the Museum of Science and Industry and grouse about the fact that we didn't have the Formula One race, the United States Grand Prix, over the original circuit of America's first automobile race. We're not going to have that, but we are going to have a celebration. And John, if you would, widen your shot a little bit and show all the activity going on here. Apparently, we're going to have some kind of a dedication and all that. And first of all, you are. George Bovis, one of the members of the committee that has been putting this all together. Okay, tell us what's going on here. What are we, what are we, uh, what are we about to do? Well, it's been two years in the planning, but we are going to be dedicating a very large piece of Wisconsin granite with a plaque commemorating the first race in America. And there will be uh, upwards of 100 cars here, starting with perhaps uh, several dozen pre-1920 cars that are parading down here as we speak to recreate and reenact the route uh, today. Did you get permission to take to go, because I know Michigan Avenue, the big problem when we did the thing last year to try to show what the route was, is that Michigan Avenue from about, almost from the loop all the way down here is one way the wrong way now. Uh, how are you going to get around that or did you get police cooperation? With, with We have some police cooperation. The city and the park district has been very helpful to us as we've come to the conclusion here. And uh, all of the cars will be obeying all of the uh, speed limits and laws and rules of the road. But uh, we're hoping that we'll be able to assemble a reasonable be orderly parade down that very important section. We have a uh, historically recreated route that to the best of today's roads duplicates the uh, 54 miles that were traveled originally and uh, that will be what they will be uh, using. 
Okay, now I don't want to put you on the spot, so if you're not real familiar with it, go ahead and back off of the question. But the audience has heard Bill Wilt's perception of the original race, and I've gone to the Chicago Historical Society and gotten all the original documentation and, and the photo stats of the newspaper from the Times Herald. Now, give us a little bit of your feeling of the race, uh, both of what it was and its importance and the rest of it. Well, first of all, we're very glad it's not snowing today, and that's the one lack of authenticity that we'll uh, accept. But we got the temperature. The but we have the cold. Uh, there's just no way to state it more clearly than that this was the event that introduced the automobile to America. It took place here in Chicago, which at that time was the center of the automobile industry, and from this humble beginning, the industry grew into Indianapolis, South Bend, Detroit, and other uh, cities uh, which now uh, represent the auto industry we have today. So this was the beginning. You know, in a sense, it doesn't surprise me. I've been all over the United States. I've raced literally everywhere, and what many people are not aware of is that Chicagoland in the Midwest really is the heart of motorsport and when you look back to what the origin of motorsport was that the very first automobile race ever held in the United States was held right here in Chicago it's really not a surprise that we seem to have more racetracks more race cars more participants we've just forgotten why well this is an excellent time to remember that a hundred years ago it all began and today we can remember that we have such wonderful tracks as Road America and Blackhawk Farms right here in the greater Chicagoland Midwest area. Not to mention Santa Fe Speedway and Raceway Park and Grundy County Fairgrounds and Ileana and Union Grove Drag Strip and US 41 and I'm going to forget somebody and I'm going to be very very embarrassed and I'm sorry if I do folks because it's really really cold out. We did get that part of the thing right. As a matter of fact I feel a little bit like one of the pioneers today. We are definitely freezing out here. The guys are having all kinds of trouble with the wind and that's how it was 100 years ago. Yes it is except they didn't have these wonderful pieces of clothing we're wearing today. No, it's <laughs> yeah, that's it's that's right. Thank you. Thank you, Snowmobile community, for the great <laughs> snowmobile jackets and everything. Uh, anyhow, obviously what I really would have liked to have happened is, and I've said it on the program many times before, starting seven years ago at the first show I did about this event and trying to plant seeds, I would have loved for this, and, and it's not over. Maybe we can do it for the 101st or the 102nd. What a wonderful venue this would be for the United States Grand Prix, a Formula One race over the original circuit. About 95% of the roads are still there. It's not going to happen this year, but we're not going to let it go by without noticing it, right? Let's hope so. Yes, okay. And and you guys have done a lot of work on this. And by the way, what's the name of the organization again? It's the American Auto Sports Centennial. Well, I want to congratulate you guys. I'm glad that somebody you know, jumped in here and made it happen. And hopefully we're going to get a chance to look at some of these cars before they take off. And thanks for spending time with us. Please don't run away. Girls, if you would, tell the folks. Don't go away, folks. We'll be right back. Of course we were delighted to see that the American Autosport Centennial Committee had indeed produced an event marking this moment in history, and we were also pleased to find an old friend of Motorsports Unlimited in attendance. As the preparations continue, look who we found here, our old friend John Valley. As a matter of fact, before I do it, John, please reintroduce yourself to the audience and tell them who you are. I'm John Valley. I'm from the city of Oakbrook Terrace. You're not just from the city of Oakbrook Terrace. This is kind of Mr. Oakbrook Terrace. You're one of the aldermen, right? Yes, I am. Okay, this is John Valley, and I, I won't go into the whole song and dance. John Valley is one of those guys that couldn't be more proud of his community, which happens to be Oakbrook Terrace. This guy knows everything there is to know about Oakbrook Terrace and is extremely proud of it, right? Yes, I am. Okay, you're exactly right. What are you doing down here, John? I wanted to be a part of this um, 100 years celebration, and I think it's really important, and uh, I'm really excited to be here. I brought my son down here, and uh, I think we're going to have a fun time today. Yes, it is a little piece of history, and it's very, very important. Like I say, obviously, I'm glad that we're having some sort of a celebration and everything. I'm not going to spend the whole program grousing about the fact that we don't have a Formula One race here, which is what I really would have liked shown live in front of an audience of a billion people in a hundred countries on television. On the other hand, it is being remembered by a number of folks, and you as a car enthusiast, this is an important day for you. This is an important day. What else is there besides mother, apple pie, and the automobile? That's what makes America. Isn't that the truth? That's the truth. Okay, John, you do the Oakbrook Terrace car shows every year, and I know this is pressing you a little bit because it's a long time away as we speak right now, Thanksgiving Day, so it's at least six months until the first one, but I know you've got a couple of dates already because you guys are doing the Oakbrook Terrace car shows again this year, right? Yes, we are. We Everybody's called us up and says, please, do some more shows, and we're going to do some more shows. They've worked for our community. I believe the first show is going to be July 14th, and the second one's going to be August 4th. And as I understand it, you're kind of working on a Mother's Day show? We're trying to get Mother's Day. We're trying to see if we can get the committee to commit to that 
and I hear one of the cars now. We hear one of the, we, we see, this is great. This is absolutely terrific. Uh, yes, Tina, you were going to say. Uh, I was just going to mention to John if he could uh, arrange getting some of that weather he always gets for the Oak Brook Terrace car shows today. Right. John is an expert. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell our cameraman, John, swing your shot over there as, as we're talking so that they know what we're, uh, what we're all being uh, distracted by. I, I, ho I, hope, I know that caught John by surprise. I hope we got that on camera. We'd love to have some of that at Oak Brook Terrace car shows, wouldn't we? I would like to have all kind of cars there, yes. Y you're exactly mm -hmm. right. Antiques, hot rods, uh, street, rod. street rod, everything, right? stock cars anything yes yes I agree completely in any event I, I, I'm delighted to see you down here I'm not surprised at all but I'm glad to see you down here a lot of us hardcore motorsport fans are, are, are taking uh, taking this in and even though I gotta say John maybe you should have more than a t-shirt uh, I believe so it's, it's pretty nippy out here it, it's, it's, warm. <laughs> yeah, you, you, at least we got them keeping you warm uh, thanks for spending a little time with us and Tammy this girl's from Hawaii can you imagine what she's going through <laughs> tell them folks don't go away, folks. We'll be right back. That was a great Stanley steamer passing by as we were chatting with John Valley. And as we finished our interview, we noticed an antique car in the staging area. Let's take a look. We have some brave folks here. I think they're the first car in line to begin in the parade. And first I'm going to get their names and you are? Uh, Bob Casey. Where are you from, Bob? Uh, from Dearborn, Michigan. And you are? Glenn Miller from Dearborn, Michigan. Okay, I understand this is your car? Yes. Okay, I'll be back to you. Let me make sure we get all the principals in. You are? Daniel Miller. From? Dearborn, Michigan. Okay, and by the way, folks from Michigan, this is a bitter pill for them to swallow because the very first automobile race ever held in the United States was held right here in Chicago, 1895, and I'll bet the people who live in Dearborn, Michigan think it should have been there because, as we know, of course, Detroit's the capital and all that, so and you are. Janine Miller from Dearborn, Michigan. And? Julia Casey from Dearborn, Michigan. Okay, now you guys didn't ride all the way here in this car from Dearborn, Michigan. No, no. <laughs> no. It, it came on a trailer. It, it came on a trailer because the, the looks on their face is like they're going for sympathy on this thing. Like maybe, maybe they came all the way from Dearborn. Okay, back to you. Tell us about your car. It's a 1912 Rambler, uh, models Country Club. It's a 432 cubic inch four cylinder, and well, you're talking about 100 plus cubic inches each cylinder. Right. Yeah, it's a very large engine. It has a lot of torque. What kind of RPM does the engine run at? Um, it'll run up to probably about 1800, so it's quite slow. Actually, that's quite high for that time. Oh, yeah, for that time, but it's uh, slow by, by today's today standards. Surely. Uh, tell us about the rest of it, the running gear, and, uh, the, the, uh, what the car was designed to do and all that. Well, this was, a, this was a, actually quite a luxury car at the time. Um, you could, uh, when Model Ts were out, you could probably buy about five Model Ts for what this car cost when it was new. It was about $3,500 new which was a lot of money in 1912. Uh, no question about it and at that time we were just going through the transition of cars that were thing, well, uh, thing, play things for the wealthy as opposed to being viable transportation devices. Right. And this was still one of the playthings for the wealthy. Oh yeah, this was a luxury car. Yeah. Okay. Do you use it very often? Oh yeah, we drive this on a lot of tours. We probably run it maybe 1,500, 2,000 miles this year. What would provoke you to come all the way to Chicago here on Thanksgiving Day? Uh, hundred year celebration of the first race. Yeah. You know, I was wanting to do it for years. <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to tell you something. I was starting to think I was the only guy in the world that knew that this was the uh, start. You know, the very first automobile race in the world was, or in, in the United States, was held right here in Chicago in 1895. I was starting to think I was the only. So it's gratifying for me to see all these folks. Apparently, you knew all the way in Michigan. Oh yeah, I've been looking forward to this for a number of years. Okay, and yourself, same reason? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Why don't yeah. just be a Besides, it's my birthday today. So. Well, happy birthday. How old are you? <laughs> right. uh, I'm old enough to know better than to do this. <laughs> <laughs> One would think so. One would think so. Uh, how about yourself, son? Uh, did they just drag you here kicking and screaming, or is this something you want to participate in, participate in and be a part of history? I wanted to be a part of history. I really like doing this kind of stuff. Oh, I think that's terrific. These We need more youngsters like this that care about cars. Miss, what do you think? Part of history or just get dragged into it? Oh no, I definitely chose to come. You definitely enjoy this sort of thing and you and you recognize the significance of the day? Oh yes. Because I think I think maybe for for the ladies and, and, and I don't want to appear to well, I don't know why I don't want to be, appear to be sexist, but I don't want to appear to be sexist. But I think for the ladies it's more of a sacrifice because normally it would be Thanksgiving Day at home with turkey and all that sort of thing. And instead you're gonna take a really long cold ride in an open car. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I, I worked with automotive history for uh, 10 years in an archive, so it's something that I know something about. In fact, you have the curator of automotive history standing over there from the Henry Ford Museum. 
who is the curator from the Henry Ford Museum? Okay, it is my understanding that Henry Ford in his autobiography wrote that one of the real sad things in his life was he couldn't beg, borrow, or steal the money to make it to America's first auto race. And then he mentioned that in his autobiography. Do I have that halfway right? Uh, well, I think so, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah. Uh, uh, of course, a year later he was making his own car, but he uh, um, was, uh, he'd gotten interested in it and, and he couldn't, couldn't make it here. And really wanted to be part of it badly. Yeah, well, he didn't have a car to, to be part of it with. No, but wanted to at least be an observer and all that. Yeah. And, and I understand that he wrote about that, that it was important to him he didn't make it. Now, I left one person out of it, so let me lean over here because I want to make sure we get everybody on camera. Same thing, this is going to be a long, cold day for you. <laughs> yes, but I, I wanted to come and be part of it, though. Okay, it was important to you too then? Yes. Okay. Now, we've got a cute way that we close this, and if I can, I'm going to ask you guys to tip forward a little bit, both of you guys together, and I want you to look over there at our camera, and what I'd like you to say is... Don't go away, folks. We'll be right back. As we were completing the interview, more and more antique cars were arriving, and we were getting very excited about the event that the American Autosport Centennial Committee had created. Well, this is turning out to be a wonderful event, may event, maybe even better than the Formula One race that I had envisioned for this big celebration, because the antique cars down here are absolutely wonderful. We've seen a Stanley Steamer, a running Stanley Steamer, and I mean one that flies going up and down the road many times. Hopefully we'll catch up with them. First of all, we've got another great antique car here, and you are? Bud Jonas. And where are you from, Bud? Belding, Michigan. Uh, tell us about your car. What have we got? Uh, it's a 1904 St. Louis. And there were four of them made, and as far as we know, it's the only ones left. Only four of these made? Yes. Oh, what a wonderful piece. I assume you had to do a ground-up restoration on it. It was, uh, well, everybody said, don't fix it. <laughs> it oh. was junk. Oh, it was, oh. it's gorgeous. What, how long did it take to, do, to, to make it look like this? Uh, it took me nine months. Oh, did you do any of the work? All of it. You yourself personally did sure. this work? Well, that's what you have to do if you love these things. You do that kind of work. Wait just a minute. Incredible. Wait just a minute. Look at this brass work, the interior work. The that are do you do this for a living? No, as a hobby. Oh, I what a wonderful collect, piece. I started collecting cars in 1948, so I've done a lot of restoration work. Well, this must this, be the rarest one you've ever had. Yes, and this car was interesting. It was stored in Detroit in a coal bin standing on end to conserve space, they stood them up on end. Oh. Oh. And you found it and brought it back to life. What a wonderful piece of work. And apparently it runs. I saw you drive up. Yeah, it'll, it'll run. You think you're going to be able to make the 54 oh, miles? Oh, sure. You Seriously? Oh, sure. Well, wait, it look, runs right along. Let me just see what the ladies have to say about this, because this is an awful cold day. First of all, you are? <laughs> L.D. Campbell. Where are you from? California. Oh, you got to be dying today. <laughs> Absolutely dying. Oh, and you are? I'm the better half. I'm Lorene Jonas from Belding, Michigan. And he says this is your car. Oh, sure. <laughs> now, are you guys going to enjoy this today? And i got to say, I think for the ladies involved, it's a bigger sacrifice because this is Thanksgiving, and typically you'd be in a nice dining room with a turkey dinner and all that. Is this really worth it to you? Sure. He doesn't like turkey anyway. <laughs> So you're looking forward to this? I don't have to fix dinner today. Well, that's, I can eat out, so. that's true. This is a special moment in history. I, you, I'm oh, sure you guys are aware of it. Yes, very much. It, we're real excited. It's a beautiful day. Could I've been, have been a lot colder. I've been in colder weather. With the open car? With, with, uh, yes. And you still like it? And you have to go like this in order to breathe. <laughs> and, and you still enjoy it? Oh, yeah. Well, we've done it for 44 years since we got married and even before that. Oh, I think this is absolutely <laughs> wonderful. And how about yourself from California? These guys must have talked you into this. Oh. Well, I don't know. We just all of a sudden decided it was a good thing to do. <laughs> Boy, talk about it was New Year's Eve and we thought it was a good idea at the time. Well, you'll see, this is going to be fun today. I want to thank you for sharing the car with us. What a wonderful, wonderful piece of work. I congratulate you. And girls, can I put you to work for one second? Is that all right? I'd like you to look over there at our camera. Duck your heads together just a little bit if you can. Look over at our camera. I want you to say... Don't go away, folks. We'll be right, right back. back. Just as we finished the interview, they were beginning the dedication ceremony. Let's watch. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Be be because it's a little bit cool still, but a beautiful day for our race, we'll have a very short program. Norman Ross is my name, and it's my real pleasure to welcome you to this 100th anniversary of the day the automobile was introduced to our country, an historic day then, an historic day now.
Even Washington, you know, is observing it. The last five stamps that are being issued this year are all of vintage cars ranging from 1893 to 1901. At the original race, there were 83 contestants who lined up, only six all equipped with a foghorn or a trumpet in order to let other vehicles or pedestrians know to get out of the way. Only six ended up by being in the race. They started up at the starting line. One of them ran into a horse cart in front of the Art Institute, they tell us, and, and another one crashed into a sleigh. And we're lucky to have with us today the great-grandson and grandson of the winner of that race. It was on a very blustery Thanksgiving morning, 100 years ago today, after a 12-inch snowfall. Only two of, of the cars, traveling at about 15 miles per hour, made the full 54-mile trip from here, at almost this spot, to Evanston and back again. Both internal combustion vehicles. In 1945, on the 50th anniversary of the race, more than 30 vehicles turned up. Today we have more than 100. 100 participants, many of the cars dating back to the turn of the century, uh, back at a time when there were only 150 miles of paved road outside the cities in our country. 1900, only 150 miles of paved roads outside of the, the cities. Maxwell, Packard, Pierce Arrow, Model T, Nash, DeSoto, a lot of the great old names. And, and the cars come to us today from Minnesota, Wisconsin, Kansas, Michigan, Indiana, and of course, Illinois. After just a few remarks from Jerry Foreman, who's really our leader in this, and others, and the unveiling of the plaque, which is right here, which the Duriers will do for us, the race will begin to go up King Drive, Michigan Avenue, through Lincoln Park, up to Evanston, where at the uh, Historical Society, the old uh, uh, Dawes Hub Mansion, they'll have a lunch and then turn around and come back here. 100 days of, of this observation that's been in the planning stages for some 30 months. Jerry Foreman, who's the chairman, is the founder and the president of Hammer at Home. It's a construction company based here in Chicago, and I know they do good work because they've done some for, for, for me. He was an electrical engineer at the General Motors Institute, and he restored his first classic car when he was still in college. Jerry, would you also, when you uh, come up to the microphone, introduce your fellow members of the executive committee. Two years ago when we started thinking about this, we all wondered whether anybody would remember what happened 100 years ago today. I think just looking around, we all know that it's going to be remembered not only today, but for a long time to come. I'm really thrilled with everybody who's here. We're glad to have you, and it's been a long road getting here, but we're just, just thrilled to have everything happening today. I do want to introduce the executive committee that's worked real hard with me. They're just the beginning. There's a lot of other people, too, but I'll start over here. This is Barney Shoecraft, George Bovis. This is George Brugenthies here. John Clean. John. Alan Loeb with the great hat behind me. That's the six people, including myself, of the executive committee have been working for a couple of years on this. But as I said, there's hundreds of others. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce George Bovis to have a few words. Everybody's going to be brief today. We're all cold and we're all anxious to get into those nice warm cars. <laughs> well, 30 months, a lot of sweat, tears, frustration, and you all are the psychic income we've harvested. Thank you all for being here. You've brought wonderful automobiles, you've brought yourselves, and you have made this a 100th anniversary celebration on Thanksgiving that none of us will forget. So we thank you very much. Now we're going to have the unveiling of the plaque which was just put on this rock yesterday, a permanent plaque, and we have the great-grandson and the grandson of the winner, Mr. Durier, of that very first race a hundred years ago, if they'll do that. And then we have a couple other things for you, and then we'll start the race.
Well, uh, thank you. Uh, on behalf of the uh, J. Frank Duryea family, uh, my father and uh, my mother Marita, who are here today, uh, we want to thank you all for turning out on such a uh, uh, important day in auto history. It, it represents a, a, a great period for the uh, a year ahead, and uh, you're taking the time out of your Thanksgivings is a wonderful thing for us to see, uh, and uh, uh, we salute you. Um, this is an imp important day in, in auto history, and uh, it, it really has been a great month for the Duryea family. We were in New York earlier this month uh, for the unveiling of the uh, commemorative stamp, and uh, today's event uh, ends the month on a, a real high point, and that is uh, uh, commemorating not only 100 years of automobile racing, uh, but really what uh, historians like uh, Dr. Scharsberg and uh, Tom Reese and some of you here uh, uh, who are here today uh, recognize as uh, the birth of the automobile industry and really when Chicago uh, introduced uh, America to the automobile. Uh, it's appropriate that it is cold today, and uh, uh, you all know the conditions that we uh, or were faced in the uh, on the first race. Uh, we're slogging around in a bit of snow, uh, and uh, that uh, uh, terrible weather may really have been a determining factor in proving the reliability and uh, truly the viability of the automobile and uh, the changes that it, it proved. Uh, we're not alone. On the 50th celebration, it was 16 degrees, so uh, don't feel too uh, uh, too bad and uh, so in the uh, uh, spirit of uh, J. Frank uh, Duryea today should uh, really be no different. Um, many of you are from different regions of the AACA and uh, Horses Carriage Club of America and uh, we're going to be dragging our uh, 03 Stevens Duryea around the country here and try to visit uh, with many of you in your uh, specific uh, regions. Um, the brass era uh, uh, folks who are restoring Brass Era cars uh, it, are in a particular, I think, uh, very important stewards of some great pieces of artwork, as we can see here uh, today, lining the uh, road. And uh, this year, more than any year, uh, gives us a, a wonderful opportunity to uh, uh, give exposure uh, and, and really allow people uh, accessibility to these great pieces of, uh, of work. Uh, and perhaps along the way, we can inspire some more enthusiasm enthusiasts uh, to our great hobby here uh, and of course have some fun. Well, at, at this point I feel like I should say gentlemen start your engines but maybe if I can uh, get you up here dad we can unveil the, uh, uh, the, the plaque. A word now from our historian, Dr. Scharsberg. Thank you very much. I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to say just one or two words. They said, keep it short. And uh, I was almost tempted to pull something that's a little bit theatrical. Uh, I may do it yet and then just take uh, one or two moments. My purpose here is to, is to try to put this race in perspective in terms of why the race and why Chicago for that race. My, my inclination was to uh, really keep it short and uh, say uh, what was the significance of the race. Well, here it is, right here. This is a booklet prepared by Frank Duryea, and it says when Chicago introduced the automobile to America. That's why the race. This event, more than any other event that occurred at any other time, was responsible for opening the door on the auto age. It began here. It began in Chicago. The great significance of it is precisely that. Nearly every historian, never, nearly every auto enthusiast dates the auto age beginning in 1895. Herman Colsat, editor of the Chicago Times Herald, had the idea for it from uh, uh, watching uh, uh, the uh, the uh, race uh, in uh, in Paris, and uh, decided that 
America needed it too. He uh, promoted it, and it started from relatively near here. And uh, with that, uh, I think that's enough. Just remember what Frank said a few years later, the significance of the race when Chicago introduced the automobile to America. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharsberg. We have a proclamation to read now. Joe Kalinis, who is assistant to Virginia Rugai, an older person in Chicago, will read it to us. Joe? Thank you. Good morning. It's a proclamation from uh, Mayor Richard M. Daly of the city of Chicago, and it reads as follows. Whereas the automobile has become a major economic force in our nation, and whereas in America, the automotive age dawned on a single day, Thanksgiving Day, 1895. And whereas, on that day an event was held in Chicago that truly introduced the automobile, a motor contest, to America and sparked a transportation revolution that continues today. And whereas, because of a singular importance of this event, a volunteer committee of individuals has formed a not-for-profit Illinois corporation, the American Auto Sports Centennial Incorporated, to coordinate the centennial celebration. Beginning on August 9, 1995, excuse me, and accumulating on Thanksgiving Day, the 100th day period has been selected as the official celebration period. 100 days for 100 years. And whereas the American Auto Sport Centennial Executive Committee will hold its centennial celebration of Chicago's historic 1895 auto race on November 23rd, 1995, and the Midway Plaisance, and whereas the 100th day celebration will be celebrated with events reflecting the theme to commemorate the 1895 event when Chicago introduced the automobile to America. The program features cultural and educational activities and a reenactment tour. Now therefore, I, Richard M. Daly, Mayor of the City of Chicago, do hereby proclaim November 23, 1995 to be the American Auto Sports Centennial Day in Chicago and urge all citizens to be cognizant of the events arranged for this time dated this 15th day of November, 1995, and signed Richard M. Daly, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Joe. One of those who's here today, I wish he'd come up and take a bow, John Kelly from Freeport, Illinois. He was also here 50 years ago when they had the 50th anniversary. John? Oh. <laughs> He's dressed for the occasion. <laughs> it was cold, it was wet, and there were hills in Chicago that you wouldn't believe. <laughs> Honest to goodness, I had an 1895 Orient buckboard, and uh, uh, the uh, transmission was a flywheel, and if you got to a hill, you had to turn around and go up backwards, really. <laughs> I, I, I'm honored to be here, and thank God, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Really enjoying it. Good to have you here. <laughs> uh, we'll end our uh, short program now with George Rugenthies, president of Tempo Incorporated Motorsports Promotions and Marketing. He's a graduate of Loyola. He's been a driver. He's run a number of different events, been directors of them, and he'll tell us about our logistics for the day. just about 9.30 right now, and uh, we'll be starting at 10 o'clock. The, uh, the green flag will, uh, will fall. Mr. Bovis, the starter, will, uh, will start the event. I understand we're going to have a police escort for the first part uh, uh, of this program. Uh, the police car will lead, and then the 57 uh, Chevy police car will be the, the next car. And uh, we'd like the early cars, as we're lined up, to uh, follow in sequence. And uh, there will be uh, police cars uh, occasionally uh, in between us, and they will also, uh, I understand, be uh, blocking some of the intersections so that we can continue uh, as a group. Um, 
if anyone has not registered or received the uh, the route instructions, uh, there is a registration will be open for. Uh, we'll have about a half hour after the program before we get started. They're right at Stony Island in a, uh, a tan Cherokee right by the light on the uh, right-hand side. And uh, it has uh, directions and instructions in there. If there's any questions, we could uh, possibly answer those now. That's great. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much, George. That ends our program, 100 days for 100 years. The American Auto Sports Centennial Committee did a wonderful job, including selecting a fine monument to mark this historic spot. Congratulations are in order. Nicely done. While we were enjoying the ceremony, we noticed many old friends of Motorsports Unlimited in attendance, including these folks. Well, look who we found here, and Tammy, tell the folks what a Corvair is. I don't know, though. She doesn't have a guest. You see what we're up against? It happens all the time, Bill. Okay, we're going to talk to the pretty girl first, and you are? Mary Beth Claypool. And? Larry Claypool. Okay, these guys, our regular viewers are going to remember, are the, this is essentially Mr. and Mrs. Corvair, which means nothing to Tammy because you don't know what a Corvair is. No, I don't. Please go ahead and tell her what a Corvair is. Corvair is a Chevrolet made in the 60s. That's, well, boy, there's a brief comment. Go ahead and tell them what a Corvair is. <laughs> well, more than that, it's a rear-engine Chevrolet made in the 60s. It was air-cooled and probably was what mo <laughs> It's cold today, Bill. It's really cold. Oh, yeah. One of the most significant cars made in the 60s. No question about it, and he will be very uncomfortable when I say the Corvair essentially was an American big Volkswagen. Well, that's right, Bill. That, that, that's what its target was, was uh, for the, uh, to be the American Volkswagen, and uh, didn't quite turn out that way in the end, but it was a very significant car. As a matter of fact, have you ever heard of Ralph Nader? No, I haven't. Oh, I, I don't even know where to start with history. Ralph Nader, America's biggest consumer advocate, started his career by killing the Corvair. <laughs> Am I right? That's right. Uh, the Corvair made Ralph famous, and the uh, Ralph made the Corvair infamous. You're exactly right. Tell us, what are you guys doing down here today? Celebrating the 100th anniversary of the race that happened in 19, 1895. Isn't it kind of cool to be a part of a little piece of history? It's great out here. There's just an incredible uh, variety of cars out here, and I'm glad I'm not driving a really early open car today. Hi. Boy, I'm telling you. All right, we've got to move it because I want to see if we can take a look at a couple more of those cars, and if you would, please, you know how to do this? You remember this? Don't go away, folks. We'll be right back. We returned to the cars and found pre-race tension building. Well, the excitement is really building here. This is the reenactment of America's first auto race. And John, if you would, there's no way we can cover all this. Broaden your shot, swing both directions so the folks can see. Uh, there are, there's got to be over a hundred antique automobiles here, and this is absolutely gorgeous. If you would, please introduce yourself. Marion Haynes from Lavenue, Indiana. Tell us about your car. What have we got? 04 Oldsmobile, French hood, seven horsepower. Is this a complete restoration? Right. Ground up restoration? Ground up. Yeah, did you do any of the work? Did it all. No, you did it all yourself, seriously? Oh my goodness. Did the paint work? Uh, I had a new radiator built by somebody. You did everything else yourself? It, yes. Well, I am very impressed. And again, folks, you'd have to be there to see that this is a magnificent piece of work. What brings you all the way here to Chicago? Well, there's a few people told me they were coming, and I decided to come. Wife stayed at home and having Thanksgiving dinner. Now, are you going to be able to make the whole 54 miles with this car, do you think? Sure. You don't think it's going to be a problem? No problem at all. Well, listen, congratulations on a beautiful piece. I don't want to hold you up any longer. Appreciate taking a little time. Don't run away. Girls together, tell the folks. Don't go away, folks. We'll be right back. There were so many great cars in so little time. Let's look at another. I regret that in just a very few short minutes, all of these wonderful cars are going to be gone, and I won't have had an opportunity to present them to you. I have said so many times on Motorsports Unlimited that we don't do nearly enough with antique cars. These are our roots, and these are wonderful pieces of equipment. First of all, on Motorsports Unlimited, we always talk to the pretty girls first, so if you would, please introduce yourself to our audience. Uh, hi, I'm Eileen Cruzy. And where are you from, Eileen? We're from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Long way from home. Oh, yeah. you got to be freezing. <laughs> well, it's not that bad. Okay, I'm going to reach across you if you don't mind, and you are. Jim Cruzy. Uh, also from? Fort Wayne. Okay, tell us about your car. It's a 1913 Renault. 
uh, two-cylinder Model EK. Uh, tell us a little bit more about it as far as what was going on at the time when this was being manufactured. Well, this car was manufactured in France, so it's a European car, one of the few that are on the run today. Uh, at this time, it was right before World War I, and Renault was very instrumental in World War I as far as this particular car. Uh, in what respect? Um, this particular car, this chassis, actually ferried troops back and forth to the front and during the war, this very chassis. Now, do you really think that you're going to be able to make the whole 54 miles in this thing? We put about 3,000 miles on this car last summer. No. Yeah, so we tour quite extensively. I don't think it'll be a problem. Now, did you restore this yourself? It, did it ourselves. You did. You personally did the work? Yep. Took about four months to do, uh, the winter of 93. I, am I cannot be more impressed with the number of people we have talked to here today that did the restorations them themselves. And I can tell you this doesn't always show on television, but these are magnificent pieces of work. You are to be congratulated. This is beautiful. Thank you very much. Now, do you share his enthusiasm or does oh, he drag you in kicking and screaming? Of course. I love this. This is a great hobby. So this is not a terrible way for you to spend a Thanksgiving? Oh, no. This is great. Okay, you guys, I am sure, are quite aware that you're sharing a really a special moment in history, this being the 100th anniversary, the first automobile race. This is a great event and we're so proud to be part of it. Okay, well listen, I hope you guys have a wonderful run and you don't break down. One good thing, we don't have snow today, so that's an advantage that they didn't have in 1895. Can I put you to work for one second? Sure. Okay, I'd like you to look at our camera right over there and I want you to say... Don't go away folks, we'll be right back. The moment had arrived. George Bovis took the green flag in hand and started the race. That wasn't all. There were more to come, but needed a little extra coaxing. The late model cars. There was even a dish of oh. Then we spotted the first to drop out. what happened.
much like the first race in 1895. A lot of this is going to be breakdowns for these guys all day long, and I think we've got the very first breakdown. You are? Uh, Barbara Davis from Anderson, Indiana. <laughs> okay, so you guys came a long way just to participate in this event, but it must feel good just to be here. Absolutely. <laughs> Do you know what's wrong? Uh, we started out, we got flooded, and then I think maybe this eats spark plugs, so he's put it, he's trying new spark plugs. And what kind of a car is it? It's a 1909 Anderson carriage made in Anderson, Indiana. Oh, so it's right from your town? Yes. Well, we, that's oh. we collect things made in our hometown. Well, that's just wonderful. And John, if you can, I don't know if this will show. This is a really interesting engine. I can see two of the cylinders, and it's an opposed twin. Uh, there's one going this way, one going that way. There might be more cylinders on the other side, but I can see at least two. This is a fascinating technical exercise looking at these early vehicles. Can I? It's a two-cylinder air-cooled. Two-cylinder air-cooled, so I was kind of correct. And can I put you to work for one second? Sure. sure I want you to look over there at our camera because you're in costume, and a lot of the folks here today were in a period costume. If you would, look over there, and I want you to say... Don't go away, folks. We'll be right back. A wonderful event, thoroughly enjoyed by all. The American Auto Sports Centennial Committee should be proud of what they achieved. Unfortunately, as the cars disappear from view, we're out of time with only enough left to acknowledge the fine work of our award-winning production team, including John Kuchan, Chris Schutz, John Papke, and Tom McGrady. Special thanks to JBTV's Jerry Bryant. Music is created for us by Fireside Recording Studio in Westchester, Illinois, and by independent artists Roger Pauley and Jerry Herbert. Of course, we have to take a moment to thank the stars of this edition of Motorsports Unlimited. Tina Liu, Tammy Pete, Peggy O'Donnell, and our host, Bill Wilt. Me, I'm Tim Murtaugh, reminding Chicagoans that 100 years ago, your city played an important role in introducing automobiles to America. You should be very proud. Thanks for watching. See you next week. This program made possible in part by support from Easy Grip Friction Drops Midway Distribution, located in Oak Brook, Illinois. This program made possible in part by support from ABC Auto Parts, located on Ashland Avenue at 138th Street in Blue Island, Illinois. Motorsports Unlimited is produced by Bill Wilt, president of the Motorsport Advancement Crusade. This program made possible in part by support from Westbrook Auto Repair located on Franklin Avenue and Dora Street in Franklin Park, Illinois. This program made possible in part by support from Racers Row Racing Apparel located just south of I-80 on Torrance Avenue in Lansing, Illinois. The Motorsport Advancement Crusade is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the preservation and enhancement of motorsport. We are entirely funded by voluntary contributions. For more information, write Motorsport. Oh, you can write the whole thing. Motorsport Advancement Crusade, if you like. But mail gets to us just fine, addressed Motorsport, P.O. Box 66242, Chicago, Illinois, 60666. Or just call area code 312-478-4224. We enjoy hearing from our audience and encourage you to call or write. Next week, folks, are in for a really special treat. It's going to be a car show, but a very special car show, Weird Cars. We mean really weird. This is a three-cylinder, two-cycle DKW. If you think that's weird, how about this 1958 Berkeley two-cycle sports car all next week on Motorsports Unlimited? So that's it, another edition of Motorsports Unlimited and the lovely ladies of Motorsports. And be with us next week because we'll have something real exciting. Bill Wilt's going to have the lovely ladies and just about anything can happen right here on Motorsports Unlimited. Every week at this time, we bring you the best in motorsports. So I'll uh, be seeing you. Bye-bye. And uh, keep on rocking.